This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marsha Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey. So tell me, Muse, of that planet of many resources which wander far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, fiber, cultivated for millennia. As we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives, the many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, cannabis in religion, cannabis in medicine, cannabis in dear old Uncle Sam. And so our odyssey begins. Today, our odyssey is not long ago and far away, it's current and in progress. It is needless to say, Uncle Sam still has a part to play, but we're gonna forget about sessions. Today, we are going to visit with my dear friend, and everybody that watches knows I only talk to dear friends. House of Representative, Majority Leader from the Hawaii State House of Representatives, Della Albalades. Welcome, Della. Thank you so much. We've been trying to get her for months. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thank you for being persistent. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming. Della was in the lead or spearheaded this whole thing of cannabis dispensaries. Yes. And so, needless to say, the day that the first dispensary opened, she was standing there and I said, now I need to talk to you. She says, okay, call me. Well, we have calls. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. So tell us about Della, though, first. I represent um, urban Honolulu, Makiki, Makali, parts of Manoa, um, Tantlis, all of Tantlis, Papakulea, Pava'a, and, and really urban Honolulu. Can you imagine walking that district? I have walked this district. And it's, <laughs> it's certainly, I, I love my district. Um, it has great um, disparity and dis diversity, but it's, it's a wonderful place to live and raise my kids. So I have two kids, both attend public school. Um, uh, I, I enjoy being in the legislature as well as um, public service. That is great. How long have you been in the legislature? Since 2006. So I, I'll be going into my 13th year. Oh my goodness. And you run every two years? Every two years, yes. <gasps> so now you're up for re-election again? Yes. And for anybody that doesn't know, the election, primary election is Saturday, August 11th. Yes. And there's no excuse not to vote. Absolutely no excuse. No excuse. No. no. And there's so much at, this, at stake. People say, oh, there's nothing to vote for. Well, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. There always is. There is. And especially in the cannabis industry. So tell us about the cannabis industry, medical cannabis. Medical cannabis. So Hawaii was actually one of the leading states. We were the first state to, through legislation, um, approve the medical use and recognize the medical use of cannabis. Uh, I believe California was the first state to do it by, by initiative. Uh, we unfortunately did not have dispensaries until we were able to pass a bill in 2015. So dispensaries are only something new. And what has happened here in Hawaii is that for medical cannabis for a long period of time, it's been solely by um, personal grow or you could designate a patient, or a qualified patient could designate a, a caregiver who could grow and cultivate for them. But now we have both. We have both, uh, people can continue to grow for themselves individually. On, in places where there are no dispensaries, the um, ability of caregivers to cultivate is continuing for some time, although we do see some point of that phasing down for the, just the cultivation part of it. And then we have dispensaries as, as an option. What do you mean? phasing down the cultivation how, how can that be so you know we, we've preserved and ensured that personal grow will continue because that's something that you know people can do, take care of their own medicine um, I think the concern about caregiver cultivations continuing is that we now have um, the medical cannabis dispensaries and we have a, a cultivation and production system there so it's just one way to regulate the market. Again, I think you know, you know, we don't necessarily foresee 
dispensaries opening up on, on the more isolated islands like Molokai and Lanai. So, you know, there's, there's concerns that, um, you know, we're going to have to continue cultivation rights but, for them. But even on Oahu, there are faraway places, you know, the North Shore, for instance. Sure. So, you know, I, I really want to emphasize that we recognize, and I think the state has recognized that personal growth, the individual being able to grow for themselves is something that, that will be recognized, um, you know, um, going forward. But I think, you know, the real concern is that we see the proliferation, and we're, we're watching very carefully all of the states that have medical cannabis as well as recreational cannabis. And I think the concern is if, if the market should be regulated. It needs to be regulated because while it is a safe plant, you know, there's lots of things that when you grow things, you can, there are lots of things that could be introduced. And so we really want to make sure that the product that is getting to our cannabis patients is quality and safe. Well, given what can be in the ground, you know, like the same thing that for lettuce and all these other things that we grow, and the water, how do you know? Even, well, except in the control area for the, the dispensary, but for regular growers That's, at home. That is the real concern. So I think, you know, when we opened up the dispensaries, we required lab testing. Right. And now patients can actually go and take their own products because we have authorized um, the testing of patients' own homegrown cannabis at the labs. And I think what's what's sometimes stunning is that, you know, the discovery of mold right. and high, heavy metals, because you can't avoid those things in an environment like Hawaii in your own home, personal home grow system. That's not to say that all of the personally grown cannabis, it has those impurities, but that's been the concern. So like, I think we now know better because we have lab testing facilities. Do we have them all over the island or or do, do you have to come bring your product to this? Sure. So um, we have lab testing facilities, I believe, on Oahu, and Maui, I believe, has some. So one of the things that we've done Just is... Just one or some? Um, I think the last I checked, I believe there were either two or three... On Oahu. Yeah, two or three that were operating, and I, I'm not sure... I, I think two I, or three I'm just on thinking Oahu. about people away from... King Street. Sure. So one of the things that we did was we don't recognize inter-island transport of cannabis by patients um, yet. We have allowed in the law, though, a limited exception so that dispensaries can transport via, um, via inter-island air, air travel for, um, for testing purposes only. So even though we don't have lab facilities on every island, the dispensaries can transport for limited purposes to other to other lab facilities if they don't have a lab facility on their island. And so again, back to the country of windward side, Oa uh, North Shore, Haleiwa, Waianae, all these people have to come to, Bish to King Street? So the dispensaries on each island, um, or, or the dispensary licensees, they have an opportunity to open up two retail locations. So on the island of Oahu, we're talking of, if you have three dispensary licenses, we're talking up to six uh, dispensary locations. Um, most of the dispensary locations currently are concentrated in the urban Honolulu area, but I believe that there might be plans to expand to other areas. You know, it's really though they have to find the right site. There's again a lot of regulations. What are about the regulations where, about where they can be? What they have to be a certain distance from schools. Um, they need to have certain security measures. I think one of the things that we found early on, and it might be changing now. You know, there were some landowners who were not comfortable with allowing cannabis to be uh, on their properties. And it's understandable because, you know, at the federal level, cannabis is still not recognized. And so people are taking risk. But finding the right places has been, I think, a challenge for the dispensaries. And yet they're still moving forward with their plans. That's great. Tell us about the reciprocity. So this year, um, this legislative what, session... What is reciprocity? So reciprocity is really allowing qualified out-of-state patients to be able to purchase in-state. And um, what we know is that there are people traveling from other states and they, they use medical cannabis in their states. And so we want to encourage their ability to also access their medicine here. 
they technically cannot transport. They're not right. supposed to be able to transport their cannabis, their med medicine with them. So we want to be sure to open up that that market for you know for our dispensaries. And I think you know it's one. It's it's important because we we are a compassionate state, and we want people to come and visit. And if they you know, like any other medicine, they should have access to their yes. medicine. So we want to make sure that it's safe. Um, you know, th it's been a balance though, because we also know that we want to make sure that there's enough supply for our in-state patients. And so that was some of the conversation this year. But you know, our I believe our dispensaries they they can operate and they want to be able to serve out-of-state patients. And so we want to be a destination that rec recognizes wellness, and we want to make it a welcoming state. So we do want to open up this this channel. So has that passed? Uh, this session in, in Act 116, recently signed by the governor, we have set forward the, um, the requirements for that. It's still going to take some time because the, the Department of Health has to implement all the regulations, but we, 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 we've given them the framework to do that. Um, two years ago, or three years ago, we had authorized them to start doing it. So we really want the Department of Health to get get going on this they've been awfully slow yes they have been but you know we we have asked them to bring up an industry that has to be highly regulated um it could they be faster yes i think this session another thing we did was we created an office of cannabis i believe office of cannabis regulation and control and so what we did was we combined the registry program for our patients as well as dispensary program into one office that will operate separately. So before it had been kind of dispersed. So we've, we've tried to streamline it and give them more um, flexibility as well as more staffing so that they can execute on the work that they need to do. Yeah, they, well, they've been slow about everything. So, uh, so tell me now, once the reciprocity, that we have an issue, people coming. I mean, I don't have an issue with the tourists. Uh, but this payment of cash. So How many tourists come with cash? You know, they're used to writing with a debit or credit card. Um, and why, why is it that everything is in cash? Well, there, there continues to be challenges with banking. And um, unfortunately, that's going to require a federal fix and a fe the federal government passing some legislation um, to, to allow for the, the transfer of money because the, the, that's interstate, you know, right. and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, the solution that we've come up with here, I believe, does allow um, people to use cash or to uh, some kind of debit card, but, but there is, you know, uh, unfortunately, we still have to, to work with that. And so, you know, people do bring cash with them. They, they uh, can access their ATM machines. Um, you know, it would be great if we could have um, more credit card transactions, but it's just something that the industry, and, and it's happening in all of the places where they have um, either recreational or medical cannabis. They're, they're struggling with this issue. So couldn't the state open, or private open, not a bank, but like a credit, you know how the credit card, I mean, not the credit, uh, a credit union. Credit union or community, but not call it a bank. But somehow that you could have this so that the owner of the facility wouldn't have all this cash at the end of the day. And there, there have been suggestions that we can do that. So I think there are people creatively looking at, at those kinds of options. The, the, real, the real fix, though, and I think, you know, again, with every election, I think as more and more states take on medical cannabis, the pressure to find and, and come up with a, a federal fix for the banking problems will emerge. So I'm more hopeful for that. Um, we could engage in trying to create a state bank or a state credit union, but those, those still face the same challenges of the current banking situation. What now, when you know, we have this, this issue of money, the, uh, the thought that I would have all of this cash to go in to a facility, the security. Not, I know the facilities are secure, but what about the patient that comes out and walks to their car or gets on the bus? All of those things that, that especially older people. 
I think those are real concerns. And so I, I, I would imagine that the dispensaries on their properties, you know, are very concerned about that too. Um, you know, in other states, um, we haven't seen the kind of crime emerge around the cannabis dispensaries as some thought that would emerge. So, you know, we have to be, be concerned about that. You know, the state was really concerned about how they were going to take in all that amount of cash in taxes. Um, and so, and I know the dispensaries have also been very concerned about having those kinds of large amounts of cash also on site. So, you know, people have been taking the appropriate measures. And so that, again, that's another reason why um, regulation is so important. You know, we, we wanted to, we want to ensure that this is, they're safe transactions and people are safe. Yeah. We can't protect against everything, um, but I think, you know, people have to be smart about when they're transporting their own and, and being yes. safe. Now, we put up a big fight against the governor and the uh, opiate bill. Yes. Of which he vetoed. Yes. And I'm broken hearted because we did, did all we could. What, why was the veto? Now, I read the bill and it said that it was an amendment to the definition. So why the veto? So, you know, when the law was first enacted, the Department of Health in 2000 was authorized actually to add qualifying conditions and to, to, to amend it so that it could be more inclusive of other uses for the medical cannabis and recognizing other medical uses. Um, they didn't start activating that process until we passed the bill in 2015 for medical cannabis in part because in 2000, it was the Department of Public Safety that really had authority over medical cannabis. I think we've seen a sea change now that the Department of Health has authority. They've actually um, um, authorized additional qualifying conditions. And so I think I, I understand the governor's veto. You know, it would have been, it, it, he could have easily just taken our legislation and, and passed it. But I think we now have an administrative process that works. Now, if that process fails in light of all of the um, findings and research that we now do have, that um, medical cannabis can be a replacement for opioid addiction and opioid therapies, that maybe, you know, then that's when the public should come back to the legislature. But I think we should allow that administrative process to occur because really at the legislature, we should be looking at the larger policy issues. And at some point in time, really, we have to ensure and defer that the executive has the ability and the staffing and the resources to do what they need to do in accordance with best practices. Well, now, the governor of Hawaii is the most, quote, most powerful governor in all 50 states with 18 departments under his purview. That's a big job. Yes. And the health department seems somehow to run amok, to do whatever they do without anybody from the top saying, hey, wait a minute, Slow down. They even got, what was it, with the health care, I mean, the nursing home, that the feds said, you aren't doing a good job because they only had nine uh, examiners. Where is it from the top that says, hey, we need to fix this? So what I happens in, from what it says that he is supposed to do, or she, or whatever, to what actually happens down in the department. Sure. You know, the Department of Health has a lot of responsibility. And I think with the cannabis dispensaries, we expected a lot from them. Um, could they have done things faster? Sure. But they wanted to be careful. I think now that we've reorganized and we've given them more flexibility over both the registry program, so the patients as well as the dispensaries, we're going to, I hope, to see more efficient use of resources. Um, they were short-staffed for a long time, so a lot of it is about staffing. Um, you know, I think the governor um, is allowing for this to go forward. The, the, the new director is, is supportive, I believe. So I think we really have to keep pushing on, on all the advances we've made. Okay, now we need to take a break. Okay. And we'll be back in a minute. Yes. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
instruments that I can play, so any chance to play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, so we're doing. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you then. Okay. And we're back. I'm Marcia, and today we are visiting with House Majority Leader Della Albalades, and we are talking about cannabis. So, tell us about, you know, there's so many questions that patients have. Certainly. Uh, once they get the card, then what? What happens? So, every year they have to recertify their card, and one of the things that we did this year was in Act 116, uh, we authorize the extension of the written certification for debilitating conditions for up to three years for chronic conditions. So we, every year we come back and we look at ways that we can improve the law. And there's numerous patient-friendly, consumer-friendly um, pro, pro, um, provisions that we put in. Another thing that we authorized this year was we're allowing for a bona fide patient-physician um, relationship to occur by telehealth. So we know that um, patients on uh, other islands may not have access to doctors who are willing to certify their medical conditions for the, the use for, as a qualifying condition. So again, th those are other things that we've done. Um, a third very important kind of pro-patient um, thing, or two actually, is that we authorize working groups for two very important areas. The first area is um, regarding um, reimbursement, insurance reimbursement issues around medical cannabis. And that was, that was my next question was, okay, now I go to the doctor and I have this forever ailment, lupus, for instance, MS. Those aren't going to go away. So what about the insurance, Medicare, and all of the, I guess Medicare is federal, so that's out, but other insurances? So that's something that we're going to be struggling with. And, you know, we know that there are actually FDA-approved cannabis-based um, medicines coming on board, right? So the issue of how are we going to reimburse and pay for these is becoming more and more um, uh, solidified as something that we need to do something about. So for the longest time, patients are paying out of pocket, and that could be very, 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 very yes. expensive. Um, so, you know, we're looking at that. But really, there's a lot of complex issues because... Insurance, you know, depending on is it federal insurance, federal insurance will not cover it, no. given the, the prohibitions at the federal level. So we have to ask, um, you know, what, what are the obstacles and barriers at the, um, at the other, you know, other levels? And what can the state do to require? There are some states moving forward, and then individually, some insurance companies may already be honoring some of that, because if they know that it's something that's like replacing opioids that could be costly or, or other medications, it, it makes sense for it them. Does. But we have to figure out what are the policy obstacles and then see if we can do anything. So Let's, that our audience knows when we talk about opiates and cannabis, the cannabis doesn't cure. No. It just alleviates as you are stepping down from your habit. It keeps keeps you sane. It, it helps you step down to kick that habit. It, it isn't, it's, what is it? A supplemental. It is not the cure. So that we want to keep that straight and the audience doesn't think sure. that Sure. And I think it's really something that, you know, the use of cannabis should be used in consultation with a, a, a physician. Yes. That's what's required yes. right now. A healthcare provider needs to help people navigate it. So so that is in the requirement. You know, there's one other area that we, we are looking at and we created a working group, and that's around employment issues. And when patients, qualifying patients who we know are functioning 
and they can function in the workplace. And in fact, cannabis allows them to function and be productive. They're concerned about being um, a dirty P test. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you know, we're looking at those issues. Again, other jurisdictions are struggling with it. We have had a long history of zero tolerance. So really, we need to come to grips with that. And so there's lots of challenges there. But because medical cannabis is recognized and we have more and more patients coming on board, it's going to become more and more of an issue for our employers. I know that the big, uh, what do you call those things, professional ball playing groups, the basketball, football, they recognize that the, their players get hurt and that this, they can use this. Yes, they, they're recognizing it. So, um, so you know, there's lots of issues and people um, can function better. They're still safe. Really, it's about are they operating um, under the influence and are they dangerous? And certainly, we do not want people who are under the influence of any drugs in situations. So we have to look at that carefully. Yeah, because we have to look at alcohol, which is legal, mm -hmm. and that's worse, far worse, to your body. Mm -hmm. And cigarettes are legal. And so we've got to look at, I think, that now, uh, can we do this safely, I guess is my question, because we're not doing it safe with alcohol other than tax it. So um, I, I had one more question for you, and now it's gone, as old age is. <laughs> anyway, uh, what next? Where do you go from here? You know, I think we have to continue to monitor what's happening. And every year, there is a push to um, recognize recreational, basically legalize um, cannabis for all uses. Um, I think we, we need to look at that. We need to keep having the conversation. I do think, though, that Hawaii is on the right track because what we see in other jurisdictions when they, they quickly go to recreational, then sometimes the needs of medical cannabis patients are lost. And really, we need to make sure, because this started, and it really is about getting um, quality, safe medication to patients who really need this. You know, I know cancer patients who are benefiting yes. from medical cannabis. We know children with epilepsy can, can be helped by this. We need to make sure that that is, is honored and, and we, we create the system that protects the medical use of cannabis. Well, thank you so much. And one last thing. Hawaii is the only state that changed from marijuana to cannabis. Was that your idea? You know, I have to say that it was a representative uh, Cynthia Thielen, who has really pushed us on that. But, you know, I think all of us have just recognized that it's cannabis, and it we should, should use, use that, that term. Word. Okay. Thank you so much, Della, for coming and spending this time with us, and we will see you next time.